I've been telling stories for years, and I've been telling stories about both of you to people for years. Um, my wife has heard all of them, and once in a while she'll say, that one sounded a little more exciting this time. <laughs> so I'm a promoter. So I thought for some of this, I'm gonna, I want to... I want to share some of my stories that I remember about you, and then you can tell me if I'm completely out of my mind or not. So I'm going to start with, this is, I, my first mixed martial arts coach was Egan. I had trained a little bit with a couple other people and got involved, and I was training with Egan for a few years regularly and kind of on the fight team, and I, we talk about mental health and, and, and fighting not always mixing. It, it's, it's so good for somebody. It, it, a big part of who I am is because of Egan. It really is. I mean, it's a, a lot of who I am as a human being is things I learned in your gym. Now, Egan always sort of commanded respect and wanted to, he was, he was in, you're in, a, in, at some point working for Merck Pharmaceuticals. You're a white collar worker. You were respected. You always handled yourself in a way. You weren't a uh, a hothead, all that kind of stuff. And, and you kind of, that would trickle down. And there was a rule at, at Grappling Unlimited that you couldn't fight outside the gym, in public and whatever. And there was a, a club called Blue Zebra, and Anthony Torres and a guy named Taco Bell got in a fight at Blue Zebra on a, on a Saturday night, or a, whenever it was. But word got around, and word got around that it was, it was a fight they had to be in, basically. Like, it, they, they didn't start the fight, but they finished it. So all the word goes around, and it's kind of a cool thing. And we come in to train on Monday, and I remember Egan's there early, and we're all there, and, and we're warming up. And Egan goes, we're, normally we do technique on Monday, but today we're going to spar. Anthony, get in the ring. <laughs> and Egan kicked the shit out of Anthony Torres. And then the other kid, I only remember was Taco Bell, did the same thing. Like not lecturing him so much, not physically disciplined. It's soft. It's, yeah, it's soft. I don't, that doesn't mean it's wrong. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 I, and I go both ways because I, I feel like I don't know which way to go. And, but I know what, what it's done to the older girls. And maybe girls and boys are different when you raise them. But you know, those are the things that you got to learn. And, and I feel like I'm going to try another way. But like what I was talking about, it's so hard when you, when you only know one thing. It's hard to do something different, just like in fighting, just like in sports, same thing. There isn't a clear answer, I guess. Yeah, I don't think there's a clear answer, but I do almost think that, you know, it's like, you look at the society today, it's like, it's getting so weak. I mean, the, the new generation, they're so, like, you say something that's not 100% positive and they take it wrong. And, oh, he's cutting me down, he's picking on me, he's, he's breaking me, he's, I'm like... Oh, I've got four woke I daughters, so I... <laughs> I have to be very careful what yeah, I say. Yeah, so it's, it's a tough thing. And, uh, you know, that's... Hence, on, on, I don't think it's on, on physical punishment or on this particular incident, what your brother did. Well, my gyms run totally different. You'll probably see a difference between the brothers here. Because uh, I had a lot of my fighters get into street fights. And Egan's someone that can make that rule because he doesn't get into street fights. Right. It'd be real hypocritical for me to tell my students that and punish them for getting into a street fight. I had a lot of syndicates in street fights. It would always be a sit down on what happened. And if they were wrong, they were talked to, disciplined right. They now, you, right. you say they were talked to. They were talked to, yeah. I'd sat them down and talk to them. And so that's all you do is talk to them? Well, it depends on how bad they If they were wrong, yeah, well, if they were wrong, I still wouldn't beat them up. I would actually bring them and beat the party. I've heard some of those stories. And, and is that a Japanese way, a Yakuza way? Is it yeah, a... It's because it's always with underworld or gangster people. So the way to do it is to do it in front of the person. And if I feel that that person, my student was wrong, if I did any type of beating to him, it'd be right in front of that person. So there's no retaliation. We do it inside the house, not outside the house. And if those guys would retaliate to my students in any way, then they'd have problems with me. So that was a kind of a respect thing. And so, you know, if my students got into any fights, like Barrett and Kid once got into a big street fight in Roppongi, I found out the thing, they weren't wrong. Yeah. And the other thing, my big thing was the loyalty, standing by each other. And if anything, the beatings would come when they didn't stand with each other. If someone, these guys, three guys got into a fight, one guy wasn't around and disappeared during the fight. That guy would either get kicked out of the gym or beaten up bad. How did you two become so 
maybe not polar opposites, but so unbelievable. How, how many years difference are you? You're the big brother, so it's only a two years difference. Yeah. We're raised in the same house, yeah, but and have, and ended up in very much similar champions, fighters, businessmen, successful everything. Markedly different personalities. How do you think? Have you guys the way you're born? You think, yeah. Because I looked up to Egan on I didn't smoke or drink because Egan didn't smoke or drink. Yeah. I did Rocky Bob because Egan did Rocky Bob. So I looked up to him. So it'd be, it'd be the most common sense to think that I would follow what he does. But I just had. But you were fire. born. You were born different. I just had that fire. Yeah. <laughs> it was just different. Yeah, you're different. <laughs> <laughs> because he used to, we'll get to some of those stories too. He used to, like I hate. I what I hated the most is when I was showering. He would. So I think it was the funniest thing, and then grab me under the, <laughs> and I would cry and scream, and maybe that his his fault is all that trauma. F f fights when you were young, physical fights. I remember one at a Thanksgiving party, only that's so one one of the few times I think we had it. I won't ask who 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 would win the fights. I don't I don't think it's I don't think it's important. But the other fight I remember is he beat me up in Maui, I think it was, at some kind of baseball tournament and. I don't know, we, the family's getting into an argument, I came in, I think he punched me. And I just, I think I left the scene, I don't know. I kind of remember that. Yeah, it was like a baseball, uh, yeah, baseball, a baseball and basketball yeah. trip. Yeah. Um, a memory I have, and I, I meant to Google the name, famous judo referee, skinny guy, Ogata-san. Um, I was promoting for judo, I was so proud to be the first American promoting judo. And we were doing a, uh, a, a weigh-in fight, and you probably had a fighter on the card. And I looked over, and, and again, I'm telling the story. I, may, I can absolutely be telling it wrong. But you had Ogata by the neck against the wall, 18 inches off the ground, screaming at him in Japanese. <laughs> you, know, you know what's funny is <laughs> there's so many stories that maybe I, I want to forget. <laughs> you, you don't remember this? No, I don't remember <laughs> You know the thing about that? Most people, be, that would happen once in a lifetime. Right, right, me, yeah. Common thing. Yeah. There was a couple of pride referees I did that too. I don't specifically remember doing that to him, and I don't. I can't really tell you why I did it to him. But, yeah, I think for Ogata, I didn't like him. He, has a, he had a real bias in how he did things, so I didn't like him. Now you, Very I, I imagine you are aware of, and I, I, don't, I don't get to interact with you a lot, as much anymore, but I feel like it's it's become much different. But the fear you would instill in people, were you aware of that? And and what was it something you would take pride in? There were a lot of people afraid of Ensign Inoue. Physically physically physic physically afraid. I, I still am sitting here. <laughs> no and, and I no I, I don't mean that in, in a joking manner at all. There's something I know I can say something stupid to Egan and he's gonna pull me aside after and say, What the fuck do you say that for? I don't know what you're going to do if I say something <laughs> stupid to you. That's a good example. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a reality. Tell me a little bit about what, is, what did it, was it something consciously you did? No, it was just my personality and I did enjoy the fear. Yeah, yeah. And what I did realize later on in life is fear itself isn't enough. In fact, fear itself can go in the wrong ways. But I noticed now I have uh, fear slash respect and I think one without the other isn't powerful enough. So if you, I can be respected, but if the Yakuza or somebody gets mad enough, they could they would come and get me. I could be feared, but if they don't respect me, they would still come and get me. Fear or respect alone wouldn't be enough to be where I am today. No, I, I don't want to delve deep into the whole Yakuza ties. There's some great stories. That, so there, you, Yamato Damashi, meaning fighting spirit would fight to the death. You, I would imagine, were in danger of being killed by the Yakuza more than once in your life. Is that fair? Is that fair to say? Not, I can't say in fear because I don't know if you were afraid of it. Although you must have had some fear. When you, were in the, when you put yourself in, and I will say that, you put yourself in those situations for loyalty, for what you believe in, whatever it was. How... How frightening was it, I guess? Was there any fear? Is there any, any story that, would, that comes to mind where you said, oh, maybe, maybe I went too far, or? I, I think fear would be tied into what you, you, 
don't want to lose. And I didn't have anything to lose back in that day. I didn't have a wife. I didn't have anything. I was, I was, I, I thought it would be a good day to die in the ring. I thought it would, if I, for my, for my beliefs, I was willing to die for, with the Yankuso and I was willing to stand up against any family. So for me, I don't think it was more f fear. It was, it was more anxiety, I think, about how it would go. And being killed and killing is two different, I mean, the same intensity. So like, if as much as I'm afraid to, I would be afraid to die, the other party would be afraid to kill. It's the same intensity, I think. So I believe that the fear wasn't there because it was that intensity and it overtook like like a journal in rush i think i i really can't say i feared anything at that point. do you um that's our beautiful dogs do you do you regret anything any uh, of that period of life when you clearly now you you have things you care enough about that you maybe are less willing to die do you regret feeling that way? Like, what if you had gotten killed? Would Think of what you would have lost. Think of the people that would have mourned. Well, where, where I am today, and the fact that I didn't get killed, I regret nothing. I yeah. regret nothing in my life, the good and bad. Because I believe right now, I'm super happy in where I am. The, girl, the wife that I have, the dogs that I have, the fact that I don't have kids that I have to worry about. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, 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 like yeah, 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 I know, trust me, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so for me, I'm content, and I believe that all the good and bad that went in my life is what made me who I am today, and I wouldn't change a thing, I wouldn't change prison time, I wouldn't change all the problems I had, I wouldn't change a thing. If you're, you talk about like people, you're in the top 0.01% of life experiences. Um, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't have wanted to go any, any go through any of that or experience most of that, but I'm envious of what to have had those, what life experience have I, I've had that have been on the edge. I'm so happy that I've had them, you know, and, and uh, the, the reasons, well, I'll, I'll go into a, a story, I guess. The reason I fought was kind of to have those feelings and watch, I just wanted to be in a war. And I don't know everyone, not everyone wants to. Um, I'm, I'm not particularly talented, but I've, pride myself on being pretty fucking tough and like being able to take a beating or whatever. Um, and, and I think it's those experiences that were, to push yourself past that, past I've done some of the stunts I've done as, as a professional stuntman now. My favorite moments in life are the moment between when they call rolling camera and action where I literally, literally, and it's happened three or four times, literally think to myself, you know, I could say no, fuck you and go home right now. You know what I mean? Like, and have a real thought, like, I, and then do it. And then go through and do it. Those, those moments, I, I had a motorcycle wreck where I broke my neck and had a real bad head trauma and I've, I've affected from today. My favorite moment of my life was hitting the accelerator on the motorcycle because I went through and I don't know, I, I, I think I know a little bit of what some of you guys have gone through with by kind of moments like that. Another one was I'm training with, I'm training with Egan and I had been training maybe a year and, and hadn't read, was thinking of fighting, training with your fight team. And, and I, I accompanied the team to a, a fight in Maui. And, I, and I, I've told this story many times and I, I could definitely, I don't think I'm exaggerating this one. And we're, we're a half hour before the fight and some fight, some fight uh, gets canceled. One fighter gets, it was somewhere near my weight class. And he goes, TJ, you're up. And in those days, again, the old MMA days were way, way, way different. There wasn't, because of the way the team was structured, there wasn't a discussion. There wasn't a thought in my mind to be like, no, I'm not ready. It's like, oh, fuck, here we go. So we're warming up. And I'd, I'd only been striking for maybe, maybe six months. And we start warming up. And I'm hitting the pads and warming up. And we, it was back when you'd have a, a locker room that was there would be a curtain and the guy would be on the other side. And I heard this guy hitting fucking mitts. <laughs> boom, boom, <laughs> boom. Like, oh shit, here we go. So I, I go out and my thought is, I'm going to work on my stand up until I get in trouble, then I'm gonna wrestle and, and take the guy down. And now I'll, I'll start by telling my memory of the fight was I went out and I threw a jab and then I 
kind of went blank. And then I'm in double underhooks on the guy in the corner. And I thought to myself, oh, I must have got rocked. I went to take him down, landed in full mount. He landed in full mount on top of me. I, I swept him and then he guillotined, guillotined me and I tapped out. That's my memory of the fight. I watched back the video and I throw a jab and I, I wish I remember the kid's name. He throws a straight right hand down the middle that drops me like a sack of potatoes, right? I'm out. I'm out. Two, three seconds. Referee waves it off. And again, this is where I talk. And I'm so happy I did it. I'm not the smartest guy in the world. I'm tough enough. I then wake up and say, I'm fine. You can see it on the video. I'm fine. It's a, it's a long shot. And I'm arguing with the referee to let it go on. This is back in the day where you could argue with the referee to let it go on. And I see Egan now in the corner to the referee. No, no, don't, don't, don't let him go on. <laughs> referee decides to let it go on. I take him down. So I lost twice in one night. <laughs> do you remember any of that? Actually, I do. And <laughs> it's like, the, the reason, like, a lot of times I would put someone into a fight in the last minute is because I've always had that belief that you're always two weeks out. And I always believe that. We trained, we trained like that. We yeah, trained like that. We trained that, that yeah. you're, you're in shape all year long. And yeah. Now, have a fight camp right before your fight. Yeah. We just always train because I feel like that's how you get better. Just yeah. That consistency of just, so, you know, when something like that would happen, I would, I mean, there's a bunch of other guys that we've thrown in and, you know, they got their experience and I feel like they don't need to suffer with that anxiety of, of here comes the fight, here comes a fight train, here's, you're just in. I mean, you got no choice. Like, just like you said, you're like, okay, here we go. Yeah. Right? And yeah. of course, you hear the other side guys hitting, and you're like, "Oh gosh, this guy can hit!" Right? Yeah. But yeah. you know, it, it, I think it, it's a it's a great thing whether you win or you lose. It doesn't really matter. It's like it's the fact that the person got in there and what you learned about yourself. Oh my God, I can't I can't say enough right? about I can't say enough about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's it's I'm I'm sad for everyone that hasn't had a fight. Um, and again, that's a left leaning, politically pacifist. The back rubs, easy. There's something about going through that. Now, a question I wanted to ask today with completely, without, without giving you any forenotice, and I need you to be incredibly honest, Egan. How good or bad was I? <laughs> now, I want you got to br 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 brutal, no, any, uh, what you know of brutally honest. So every single fighter that I've had or someone who trained with me, I always break down the whole thing. Yeah. Right, so... How much athletic ability does a person have? That one's it's pretty low. So yeah, so like, <laughs> GGA, really low. How tough is the guy? Yeah, that's important too. How much yeah. heart does a guy have? Yeah. You're on a 10 out of one. <clears throat> and like, to me, you can win a lot of fights just on heart. Yeah. Right? So you, to me, putting you in there, maybe a one year training against a guy that's been boxing almost his whole yeah. life. Right? Yeah. Since he was a little kid. A guy with heart always has that fighting chance. You know, and with grappling, I feel like it's too many even more. Yeah. But I like to see how a person's mind works because there's some people that I tell, can't, you, you got to stop. You're done. You're an amateur and that's all you're going to be. You're yeah. not going to be a pro yeah. because you cannot pull that trigger. Could I have been a professional fighter? Start, I didn't start training until I was 29. Yeah. I mean, as far as you... Not a UFC fight, fight. Not a UFC fighter. Not a champion. I would have probably kept putting you in fights and then see how you do because sometimes when guys have too much heart, it's not, yeah. it can be not a good thing. But I always believe that people can always get better. Even with little um, athletic, born athletic ability, yeah. the work ethic, which I felt you had because you're there every single day yeah. doing the warm-ups, doing everything. Yeah. I feel like those people can always get better. And I feel like there's some fighters out there that, you know, that don't have talent. But they've learned how to fight. The good news about me asking that question is that really the answer didn't really matter. I was curious, but the experience is, is, is again, I, I'll, I'll go back to it. I didn't start training at all until I was 29. And I now consider myself a martial artist before anything else. I mean, I feel like I'm a really good dad, a pretty good husband. I put a martial artist first because I use all of those kind of lessons and, and things going forward. Um, there's, there's not, well, you know, we talked last night about sort of the day I talk, I've been talking a lot about CTE and fighting and the dangers of that and friends we have that have been affected by it. Um, I, I would suggest anyone become a martial artist. I don't want my young kid be getting hit in the head. 
Like I, I think people are getting hit in the head too young. I think the brain develops to 23, all that kind of stuff. But um, I, I'll, I'll thank you for, for the, it's, it's because of you. I mean, you're the guy that taught me most. I, I trained many more years without you, but those lessons during that period of time um, are really important. And I just want to thank you. Thank you in public for that, for sure. Now, other memories I have of that time is I, I was promoting fights um, and, and I think the first time we used some of Ensign's fighters was in Guam and he had three or four fighters come in and every, every single one of them showed up in the ring with at least one black eye <laughs> be, be, before the fight. And I've, I've been through training sessions. He would come into uh, uh, GU to Grappling Unlimited and the entire fight team would lose sleep the night before because the, the training was different. Um, and again, I'm, this is a wonderful thing. The beatings you would take from Ensign, um, and, and he didn't, mean, didn't know me well enough to love me, but I know he cared about me by how hard he hit me. And I don't know if anyone else can kind of get that. But if, if he didn't do that, I've, I have black eyes from Ensign. Um, and and I, I don't know if anyone can, can get what that was like. You would, tra you would train your guys. And again, this was a, I think it's a different time that t toughness was enough to win fights. You would create the toughest fighters. You ended up having some incredibly talented ones, Tetsu Tetsuji Kato, Kid Yamamoto. Um, but you had guys that maybe weren't as talented that were winning lots of fights. Yeah, yeah. Well, I get that. I, my whole thing wasn't a sport. It was, if you're not ready to fight for real, like to the death, then you're probably going to quit the gym. So the guys who stuck with me were guys that was willing to... What percentage of people would walk in your gym and say, I want to train with you, Ensign? You'd let them train and would be there two years later. Probably about 50%. Yeah, yeah. Because the ones that walked in already knew the reputation. Yeah. So they're all pretty ready to get down to the grind. And, you know, I mean, it's a whole different day and age. Like, my belief now, I don't think is the right way to do it, you know. I, I, I agree. Yeah, yeah. If you got to go to the doctors or the hospital, you're pussy. Yeah. Suck it up. Yeah. Broken finger, tape it up, continue to round, finish the round, you know. Through training. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Throwing up, broken fingers, like, bloody hands noses. Hands yeah. Hands yeah. Shoulder don't lift. It's that's sort of some of the um, repercussions from not taking care of yourself. So, yeah, that's the thing I do. It's some to my fighters. Does. If the doctor says to rest one month, rest one month. I would I would be, I broke my, my knuckle in one of the pride fights. The doctor said I got to rest the whole month. Two weeks later, I'm cutting the cast off. And because I did that, it took three times longer to heal. And now I still don't have a knock quite can't straight in my hand. You know, all those type of repressing with you. They're coming back later on in life. So I, the, the way I treat, yeah, but see, the thing is, is there's a fine line here. So you physically, I am i can't stretch my arms out. I can't, yeah. I can't look too hard. <laughs> I think a lot of it. Yeah, but. So, the, someone calls your name and you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Inside, inside, I'm a fine tuning Porsche. Let, let's talk about the, the level that I don't think anyone gets. Um, we have friends here working with the dogs, Jay Quan and Charity, that um, didn't know who you were. Um, big MMA fans. I think that's disgusting, <laughs> personally. But it's the, reality, it's the reality of life. The level of fame you had in Japan, um, I would say... Maybe, I think you could say it would rival Conor McGregor worldwide today. I mean, your level of fame at the peak of pride, post Igor Vovchanchin, Yamada Damashi stories. Well, number one, am I right to say that? This isn't, you can Japan, put your yeah. ego, yeah. In Japan, yeah. I mean, could you go, could you go out? Could you? Yeah, um, I was always being watched, so I always had to be careful what I did. Yeah. Probably pretty much didn't. By the law. <laughs> you know, by the law, by the... Fans. Media, media. Yeah. So, yeah, that was uh, something really huge. But, you know, it, it comes with a, you know, it comes with a territory where you get the respect, too. And, you know, the, the crazy thing about me is I'm super lucky because how long have I been retired? I still get yeah. pictures and autographs when I walk into the arenas in Japan. I still get people gossiping about me. And the respect that I have is carrying through the generations. You know, you 
Would that would that happen in America? No, well, that's what I was say. Joe Rogan just had an interview with Sean O'Malley, and he was talking about me. And Sean O'Malley, said, I didn't even know who that is. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, that's really yeah. cool. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, yeah. for for in Japan, you got these you little gangster guys that they all know me for life. Yeah, yeah. It's I don't know. It's for some reason Genera- the generational. Fought, the way I fought, I think it resonates real deep with the guys, and even like the fighters now, they respect me so much because their teachers respect me. So it kind of it kind of carries real far. I think the way I fought, I think I got really lucky the way I fought, and I had that natural willingness to die in the ring i think it resonated with a lot of people to to watch like you're already watching someone in the ring say holy crap you know you know people hear that today and people say that today um it's not going to happen because of the rule set the referees people i want people to understand it could have happened in those days it was it was a it was a different referees let things go longer um i was shocked that there weren't more deaths there were douglas dead in russia it happened from time to time, but I want people to know that when you you not only said it, you meant it. People can say it, and mean it today. It doesn't it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, you're not you're not sending someone off to a, a possible death today, but you were willing to do it at the time when it was real. It was real. I, I wasn't going to talk about Eagle Bob Chomsky, but since we're since 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 we're in that, I'm going to talk about Randy Couture after. So, <laughs> but but the. the and I'll tell my memory of the fight. I've watched it a bunch of times, and I've told the story. And this one, I, I might be exaggerating, but I don't, because I make up numbers of your liver, your liver enzymes and all that kind of shit. But, but I know it had something to do with that. But you're you're in a fight with Igor Bobchanchin was the scariest. Um, think of Khabib Nurmagomedov at 220 pounds in a in a striking specialist. Khabib, <laughs> this is this is who Igor Bobchanchin was, um, and and you came out and fought him in a, in gi pants. Um, and, and although he was a good wrestler, my thought at the time and many people watching it, Ensign's only chance is to get this guy to the ground. Ensign, you're, you had just submitted Randy Couture, your, your jujitsu is spectacular. And you went out and was your plan to brawl with him? You were, you were, and for those who don't know, did it go two, it was a 10 minute round and a five minute round? Yeah, it was, yeah, but I think they stopped after the first round. Yes, that's what I mean. But I think it was so. It's ten, ten minutes, ten, ten minutes straight, um, and it was, it was the most brutal beating. And you got should, the reality is it with me. He hit, he knocked guys out with one punch over and over and over, and he with everything, and then some that he hit people guys and knocked them out. Um, and you kept getting up and and kept not shooting a takedown or butt scooting. <laughs> to, what and then you got taken away, Egan like this this. The beauty is I, you guys are so close as brothers, but not necessarily close as human beings. Like you don't you don't spend a lot of time chat, you FaceTime, you're not FaceTiming each other every night when you guys are out of the country. I love having you guys together. But you could see the care that Egan had for you in the corner. And he wasn't gonna stop the fight. Um, he probably should have. I mean, I talk about CTE and things like that. And then you ended up in the hospital for two days? Weeks. No, weeks. 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 So I, this is one intensive care, I think, for three weeks, three days. T- tell us about the after effects, medical records. What happened? What happened to your body? Um, I had a broken jaw, broken finger, uh, perforated eardrum, and a swollen brain. The swollen brain was the, the big thing. Was I think the doctor was worried about the swollen brain because it could have like a, a puncture or bleeding, but because it was swollen, it's it's uh, it's, it's stopping the bleeding. So when it comes down, that's when breathing could happen. That could be real dangerous. And I think the he was really freaked out about the, my liver count. What was your I liver? I remember him telling me it's 2,000 times a normal person. And I was like, I feel okay, though. And he said, no, the liver is something that just hits the wall. Did, did you lose consciousness? Do you remember everything? Do you remember going in the ambulance? Do you remember? I remember everything. During the flight, I think I might have flashed in and out. Yeah. She towards the end. Yeah. But um, like like you asked if it was my plan, yeah, it was, it was my plan to throw Toto. I don't know if I told Egan, but I know everyone I told didn't like the idea. But I think they felt they couldn't change when I was deciding. Mm-hmm. And I just because my fights wasn't to win, my fights was to test myself. And I thought when I saw Igor knock out Francesco Bueno in the fight before, that's the one. Yes, two hundred and sixty pound Francisco Bueno. Yeah, I was sitting in the third row, and I was sitting next to his wife or girlfriend, 
And when he got knocked out, he, he just fell. And I think Igor hit him once or twice after that. And he just fell and didn't move for a yep. long time. Yep. The wife was screaming and I was sitting there. The, the arena was quiet and I was sitting there. I got to I gotta feel that. It was weird. I got that, I had that pool to feel that for us to to stand toe to toe with him. So when I when I asked Pride to if I could fight him, that's what I thought. This is my chance. I can I can my my fights weren't to win or win trophies or get famous because we couldn't really make money or get famous. Right, right, that. right. It was to test myself. So there was my next question was was there anything in the back of your head when you were making that decision that this is gonna be great branding for me? Yamato Damashi. Yeah, well, the, the, like I said, uh, dying in the ring was uh, actually one of the best things to me. I thought dying in the ring would be the way I could. Did you know it was going to resonate with with the culture, with the world? I didn't care. No. It was for me. And I didn't. I really didn't ever think about what Egan was feeling in there because he knew that he couldn't turn the towel. And he, I think he knew that, um, I don't know, maybe he, he had his confidence in my toughness and he knew that I would probably be really upset if he turned the towel. Talk on, talk, didn't, talk didn't on that. I think I threw the towel. I no, we didn't, yeah. didn't have a towel, but there were like, how many people came and gave me the towel? And what I did is I used it to wipe my sweat and I threw it back behind me. But, you know, it's like, it's, I knew what Ensign wanted. My patch. It's like, it's a tough one. And I feel like because I made that promise, I had to keep that promise. I was hoping this never came up because it's one of the toughest things to watch. <clears throat> Your brother goes through something like that. And just because I knew that's what he wanted, I didn't know how I was going to deal with it after. But I, I know I, I know what my commitment was, and I know why I was there. So, I don't know. I mean, I think it's the same. Like, you know, when you when when you know someone wants a thing, no matter how much you love the person, you got to respect it. And I feel like that's. I mean, that was probably one of the hardest things I ever did. Is sit there and watch because your little brother. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, my little brother, someone that I cared for all my life. You know, I took care of him, and then I'm going to watch. I mean, it was like a destruction. I mean, it was just, how much more times can he get hit in the head? You know, and I, I know, I mean, everyone knows getting hit in the head like that can't be good for you, right? And, I mean, so much people came in and, like, grabbed my shirt, and, like, all the Japanese fighters, and, like, where's the powers? And I'm like, I can't. You know, but the one thing I knew is that I remember yelling at that and goes, if you don't protect your head one more time, I'm going to throw in the towel. Look at me, look at me. And he would look at me. So I knew his brain was still functioning. I knew he was still there. He was like, okay, if you don't look at me, if you don't put up your left hand right now, the fight's done. And then he'd put up his left hand. You know, but it was like, I could see he was just trying to absorb the blows and seeing how much it could take. And literally not defending himself at times on yeah, purpose. purpose. Yeah, it was like people were thinking like, Daniel's oh, he's out because he's not. But he was doing it on purpose because I would tell him. I would, he was, yeah. I mean, he was right in front of me. The beating was right in our corner. You know, most of the, most of the fight. And that was just, I don't know. That was something that I try to forget. <laughs> I think <laughs> when I hear that, <clears throat> he, he doesn't, I don't know if Egan ever knows how much that meant to me to, to let me fight because the person I am today is because of them. And the reason why I decided to retire was because of that fight, because I knew there was nothing more I could test myself in the ring with. And if I didn't have that opportunity to do that, I would probably be incomplete. Now, I have a lot of offers to come back and fight, and I'm done. I'm, I'm happy. I'm content. Yeah. I have no desire to get back in the ring. I have no itch. I have no desire to have the fame or the recognition anymore like that. And it's because of that. And like they say, you know, nowadays they say, oh, would you want to fight now? You'd probably get the fight of the nights. And, all and I say, no, because they would have stopped my fights before they even realized who I am. Yeah. And if Egan yeah. threw in the towel in that fight, the the respect and the legacy that I have now, it was obviously my legacy wasn't winning fights or winning titles. My legacy was the toughness. And without that opportunity, 
with the rules and with Egan not throwing in the towel, that that meant it's it's who I am today. And this, I the the, the undisputed title of toughness. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean that with the, the great. There's not there's nothing close for for who is tougher as a fighter. It's it's. I remember Egan. I remember knowing that Egan was really worried. I remember him trying to carry me out of the ring, and I said I wanted to. I never wanted to be on a stretcher. You wanted to walk. I wanted to walk through. And I remember walking out, and after the we left the crowd, I remember and like everything left my body. And he picked me up and carried me on his back all the way to the doctor's room. And he came with me, and Egan's always out. He's, he's a Hawaii boy, in and out. Doesn't want to leave the country for a second. And every time when he came for my fights, he would fly back the next day. Yeah. And so I yeah. thought that yeah, I thought the same thing. Yeah, it's just I got hurt. Okay, I go to the hospital, everything, and you know the doctors were. I had intensive care nurse in front of me the whole time, and he came in and was like, "Oh, he's not leaving," and he seemed real worried. And that's when I thought, "Oh shit, this must this must be pretty bad if Egan's still here and he looks worried." And I remember <laughs> Egan is so knowledgeable in nutrition and injuries. I remember him. Question the doctor, what's going in me? What's that? <laughs> yeah, Why are you yeah, doing that? How yeah. this be better? And he's talking to the doctor like that. And when he then decided to finally go home, I I knew that I was okay. I was going to be okay. It was funny because I couldn't see myself. I I I only could feel what I feel inside, and I felt fine. So when people were coming in to visit me and they're looking at me like, "Holy shit, you okay?" I would say, "What's wrong with you?" And I'm okay. And relax. But then when I finally, three days after I, I finally got to walk, get up, I got up and so much of the mirror. Like, yeah. Well, the, I, I, I don't know where I saw the picture. Your, your, your head was, yeah, was so, I mean, you got a big head already. Yeah. It was twice the set. I mean, it was a giant pumpkin. That was lopsided. Yes, yes. Yeah, it was, it was, um, who was the, the guy from that movie where they did Adventuring the Kids in Oregon? Yeah, uh, it would it would be a it'd be a funny comment. Like the Goonies guy. Goonies guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you look like the Goonies you know, guy. You know, the fight when I, I remember, he, he, I didn't know, I not necessarily let him hit me, but I remembered I didn't care if he hit me because I thought I could break his spirit by him hitting me as hard as he hit people that just went to sleep, and I looked at my corner and said I'm okay. I purposely did that. So sometimes if you watch the video, when I looked and said I'm okay, it's not necessarily because he asked me, it's because I wanted to show Igor to. You hit yeah. me with your best yeah. punch. Yep. But those punches really felt bad. I felt... Different. Hit, yeah. Different yeah, than... Hit you've, been, you've been hit by a lot, right? I felt like it was jolting me inside. And I remember after the first... So I remember Egan screaming to me at the time. Two minutes or one minute or something. And I, he was on top of me and I was saying, I'm just going to suck it up to the end because I cut him in the first round. Yeah, I'm yes. Standing, I'm going to... I'm going to... It was the it was the Rocky moment against Dra Dra Drago. You know, what I mean, he he bleeds, yeah, because he hadn't even been hurt to that point. Yeah. yeah. Watch the video. Egan came over me, and he the first thing Egan said. I remember. I remember after the thing, I said, "Okay, I gotta." Who that was hardcore. I was. I gotta get. I gotta get myself together and get up. I remember Egan leaning over to me. I'm gonna stop the fight. And I was like, "Oh shit, no! You're not stopping the fight." Yeah. So that's yeah. when I started getting up. Yeah. And I didn't realize that my legs weren't coming with my body. And they, they actually, they couldn't even get me in the chair. Egan I remember I, that, put, hiking him up out of the chair in between rounds. They pretty much dragged me yeah. in the corner. Yeah. And if you watch the video, you see the doctor come right in to check me. And I, I, he, I started yelling, no, no, because I was thinking, I got time between the rounds. Give me that recovery time first before yeah. you check. Yeah. But yeah. I guess. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty clear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, was, it wasn't an early stoppage. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to. I'm going to claim to know when you became Yamato Damashi and when you found it. Um, I was um, I was so lucky to be able to go to Japan so many times. I was over for a shooto fight and it was in a, it wasn't in Kuroki and Hall, it was in like a smaller, it was like in a gymnasium, small fight. And I, I knew you well enough, I trained with you a little bit and I went over and talked to you. Um, and you just, uh, less, maybe a week before I had fought Frank Shamrock and I asked you about the fight. It was another unbelievable war, and you got knocked out. You got knocked out with a knee, unconscious. And I asked how you're doing, and a smile came on your face. He said, "I was always worried about being knocked out, and I, and, and, and now I now I know it. And now I know it doesn't hurt. And I feel like 
that moment when when you were knocked out by Frank Shamrock click something in your brain? Because I don't know that you were willing to die in the ring going into that fight. Were you that early? Hey, John. I don't know if I was consciously thinking that I was willing to die, but I remember thinking it was a street fight and it was going to be kill or be killed. Yeah. But that was always my belief. But was that, was that moment, I just saw something that you, I remember you saying you were worried about, you had never been knocked out. Yeah. It was the first time you were knocked out and you were happy that it wasn't that big a deal. Well, I was a grappler, so my yes. was standing. So yeah. yeah. I did go in with a little bit of fear with the, in, in the stat. Yeah. When I, when I did throw down, we, we, we threw down. Oh, God, what a great fight. If anyone has it, go watch Frank Shamrock and Sinanue. Frank's a friend of mine who loved, loved the guy, too. Yeah. Just a wonderful, wonderful fight. I got knocked out. And yeah. I remember, I remember the, I, exactly that. Like, oh, shit, it ain't that bad getting knocked out. Yeah. That, that's where I got attracted to the, the standing and just throwing down. Yeah. So maybe it was good or maybe it was bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um. Uh, to you, to, last night when we were at Angela Lee's thing talking about mental health, you had a dear friend commit suicide, Seng Tian Noi, um, uh, a famous uh, Muay Thai fighter from Thailand. Uh, you were one of the first Americans to go train um, Muay Thai kickboxing. I'm not. I'm going to ask how you found him, but I want to say you you gave me the honor t to kind of vouch me, and I got over it and trained with him three different times, and and just. It's a real old school Muay Thai camp. Kids living there, which is amazing. How, how how did you find how did you find him? And just tell a little. To, so we, I don't want to get into it. We did enough emotional stuff today. <laughs> he killed himself during COVID. Um, how, how did you find him? What effect did he have on your on your career on your life? He was a good example of being super famous but staying humble. He's happy. And I, I I respect that and people that have fame but don't try to flex. How how was he famous? I mean, he was the whole country loved him. And why? So he was a hero because, like I said in seminary, Raymond Decker was beating all the Thai champions. The first American to go in and just wipe just. Yeah. And that was the king. The king loved Muay Thai, and it broke the king's heart when the Muay Thai champions were losing. And he's the one who came back, came and knocked him. Raymond. Decker. How, how did you meet him? I met him through an introduction. I wanted to train in Thailand because I knew the neckties and the kicks yeah. were really good. So I, I just reached out to um, uh, one of the kickboxing um, kaichos and he just... Happy to know him. It was, I did not like I knew him well. I just got in there and they opened me, they opened their arms to me. And me and Santian were similar in age. I think he's one year younger, one year older. And no Noi means champion? Saint Tian's his Noi name? Noi means uh, small. So his... Uh, oh, okay. His uh, name was Small Light, a flicker of the candle. Yeah. So he and, and you know the just his kindness of his heart, his humbleness. I really um, resonated to that, and I, I was some. There was somebody I wanted to be, no matter how famous I got. I always wanted to stay humble, and not think that oh, I met you know you got to give me this. You know, I even even till today I go I'll line up in the lines. You know, all this time I didn't know how famous he was, and I've spent three different weeks with him. Yeah. I thought it was just a, I knew he was a Lumpini champion, but I, I, I had no idea that he had any sort of fame. I went over, um, and, and how it works in, at his camp in most Thailand, that kids run. To, to, in Thailand, if you're from a really poor family or uh, if you're an orphan, sometimes you'll be sent to live and take the name of the camp, and they will take care of you. So if you're a very, very poor family, you send your kid away, you don't see your kid very often. They, they are set to take care of you. You run in the morning, you go to school, you come back, you run and, and, and train. And as you get older, once you hit eight, you can fight pro. I remember when I was over there, they were, try, they were trying to change the age to 11 and there were these big protests that no, we need them to fight at eight because they, they would send little bits of money home to the family at eight years old. And, and so I would come in you could stay at the camp and live in the little houses, but I would stay at a nice hotel in Bangkok and take a cab in every morning. I'm a little soft. <laughs> but I would show up in the afternoon and you'd do, uh, I think it was a 3K run or 5K run. Then you come back and you jump rope. You'd, 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 hit, you'd, you'd hit bags, then you'd hit mitts, and then you'd do some sort of sparring. And the first time I went there, they, he had me run, I jumped rope, I hit the bags, and then he said, you're done. 
And I said, I, I, I'm fine. I want to keep. No. So the entire week, I never even got to hit mitts with anyone. So I, I had to, I had to earn, earn that right. Um, came back in again a uh, month or two later for a week. Um, and I would go, I'd come in, go, go for the run, jump rope, hit the bags, and they had a mitt holder for me. And then, okay, can we go spar now? Nope. Whole week. I only went there to spar with Thai fighter. I mean, that's, I, I'm not going to be a pro fighter. I'm not, but I want the experience. Okay. So I come back my third week and my, the best part of my probably game altogether is my tie clinch. I love, yeah. I just love tie clinch. I wanted to get better at it, but I knew I'm like, I look bad running. I look bad jumping rope. I look bad hitting mitts. I look bad hitting the pads. I'm going to look good tie clinching. I want, I want, I, I, you know what I mean? I look up to this guy now. I want him to see me. So finally the third week I'm there, I get in and, and it's a, then it's a 45 minute running round of tie clinch sparring. Now they never hit, they never hit in the head, which is really, they can fight 200 fights. It's really smart, but it's just neckties. I'm like, oh, this is, it's going to suck 45 minutes, but I'm, I'm going to get through it. And this is my thing. And he puts me in with a kid that was probably 13 or 14 years old, 140 pounds. And I don't, now I'm smart enough to know this kid's probably pretty fucking good. I'm 185 pounds. I'm in really good shape. I'm it's going to suck. He, at some point, he's going to beat me up, probably, even, this little guy. But I get in, and for the first minute or two, I feel really, really good. And we keep going. It wasn't four minutes in that I started, ended up on my ass. The fucking stupid, I got a 135-pound 14-year-old just dropping me over and over. And I see Seng Tian watching me. I kind of see everyone looking out of the corner. i like, what's this fucking, <laughs> this guy Jing going to do? This Farang. Yeah. So... 15 minutes in, I got to go puke and shit. Yeah. Like, I, had to quit. I had to quit. No, I got to come back the rest of the week. I never made it to 45 minutes. Yeah. But the, 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 the training there is different. It's what, different. What story you say? Yeah, but three buddy. <laughs> Kid, you want to that? I went to that. Yeah. Yeah. Goes yeah. That. Kid Yamamoto, man. One, one of the greatest, I think the greatest fighter you've ever produced, but as far as fan favorites, his style. What? What was? How did Kid find you? What was his background? He was a and I'd say he was a punk, and with a lot of loyalty and 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 respect. And but he can't. You could tell he came from the streets, or yeah. he had he had he had that edge to him, that dangerous edge. Can you tell a, talk a little bit about Kid? Yeah, I met him because I was dating his older sister. Oh, that's right. Yes, yes. And uh, he was always in trouble, so I would always have to help him with trouble and. One of the big troubles he got into, uh, it was with the Yakuza, so he had to, the wrestling associate didn't want to touch him after that. The, the college kicked him out of college. Because he was looking to go to Olympics, yeah. kind of everything, he yeah. He had a great, bright future. Yeah, and, yeah. And nobody wanted to touch him because he had problems with the Yakuza. So I, I just told him, well, while you're, he was in probation for two years from wrestling. He couldn't enter any wrestling terms. I guess they didn't want to show ties to him. So I told him, come to my gym. And you can do MMA while you're on a hiatus from wrestling, keep your movement and keep everything going. And she just fell in love with MMA. And that's why he didn't really go back to wrestling. He, he was part of that inner circle of Ensign in a way that it was, it was so fascinating to me. Um, yet, um, I could see from the outside, it took a lot to get to that inner circle. Once you were there, there was a lot of great that came with it, but there was a lot expected of you when you talk about loyalty um, to the point where th this is a, a, a story I've, I've, I've told rarely, and I certainly never told you. I was in Japan for a pride or something, and at the time I had enough. To, we knew each other. I trained with Egan, was a pretty big promoter, and you invited me out to Rapungi one night, um, and I said no because I knew you well enough that if I was out with you and involved with whatever was going on, I was going to have to be involved. <laughs> was, was I right to be worried about going out with you during that time in your life? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, you were. So much, so much happened every week. And for lots of fun. Yeah, lots, lots of fun. Lots of fun and lots of scary stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that was my idea. It's like, how can I say no to going out? This could be the greatest night of my life or it could be the worst night of my life. <laughs>
I, I we, have a, we would probably have a great time. Yeah. In the maybe 50% of the time <laughs> something happened. And it was, it was, it was real. You would, yeah, you would probably just see on the movies. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, stuff that you can't. I know you can't talk about and stuff that is beyond movies. Kind, of. I mean, it's re, it's real underworld, Very real. like your involvement, and I did this. Your involvement with the underworld of Japan was deep and real, and to be to be to be, to be respected, I'm Charlie. Oh, there you go. Way to go, Cha Cha. I'm lucky I'm where I'm today. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think you can. You weren't. Were you there with that? Have you gone out? Have you gone out with Ensign in Japan? Yeah, I have. <laughs> I have a couple of times and then I stopped. <laughs> like I said, markedly different personalities. That that's sort of fun. When that guy came out from Unisato and tried to apologize to me after one of my fights, the guy who ran us over. Oh no, I don't think so. I just knew that story. I thought you were here. Um, I want to talk about it about your brother Egan. So I I was um, the reason I started training at Egan's. Um, was he was going to start fighting for me, and I thought it was a good business relationship to, to get, get close to him. The, the, the reason I started training at all, um, I started promoting Future Brawl and the Little Bar and then Super Brawl. We did like three pretty big shows that lost a bunch of money but didn't look that way, and it was really clear to me. I'd only been living in Hawaii for a, a year or so, and I'm using all these local fighters, and it came really clear to me that I was that fucking Holly from Boston oppressing the Wyatt Eye Boys, and it's a it's a it's a real thing, and and so selfishly and self centeredly, I decided I was a mediocre athlete, but knew I was tough. I decided to start training with some of the fight teams just to gain respect. Had no interest in being a martial artist or fighting or anything. So I started first with Jesus is Lord, um, which I actually named. They didn't have a name for their gym, so when they came out, I had to call them something. So now the famous um, the the, fa the famous Jesus is Lord gym with Ray Cooper and now Ray Cooper the third. Trained with them first. I'd go to Egan's for a day, and I'd go to Helsin's for a day. And I was I was training, and um, um, I end up at Helsin's one day, five weeks into my training career. It's just horrible, and we we have a, a a no gi class, and I have no idea what I did, but Helsin recognized that he didn't teach it, and he stopped the class, and he said, "Where did you learn that?" And I learned it from you. But it was at the time of the war between the Gracies and Inoue's. And I said, I learned it at Jesus is Lord from Ray Cooper, <laughs> right? He stopped the class and gave me a diatribe about how I'm not to, allowed to train anywhere else. You're not going to share my secrets. Now, I'm three weeks in. I'm not sharing any fucking secrets. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't know shit. And it was so amazing to me and disgusting at the time. What I watch is him in front of everyone chewing me out. And I watched a class of 20 people of four or five or six of them being like, ooh, this is, and, and the rest of the class kind of bowing up on Helsin's side, like that kind of us against them thing. And, and he said, you can't, if you come back here again, you can't train anywhere else. I got up and shook his hand. And because for me, it was a business thing. I said, I, I explained to him, I go, I'm, I have to be friends with all these fighters. I shook his hand, never get to train with, with Helsin again. So that, that's, that's the story leading up to, I'm now promoting Egan. Egan, I made a deal. The first deal I made, I made it with a couple of the people that worked out great for everyone. I'm, I made, did with you as well, a 50% partner in the fight, which is a great, you're getting 50% of, of net revenue. Um, fantastic. <clears throat> you talk about the, uh, uh, as a promoter, you want people you can work with. Fighters are always difficult. I mean, it's just, promoters are always scumbags and fighters are always difficult. And there's a, there's a range of all of those. I hope I'm a little less scumbag and Egan's much more or less uh, difficult to work with. Egan <clears throat> was getting, he's already, already famous in Hawaii as a sportsman, but getting famous as a fighter. And you were working for Merck Pharmaceuticals, also making a whole bunch of money fighting. And you bought a brand new, like $125,000 Porsche. Do you remember that Porsche? I mean, he came in. I mean, it was, it was just like, it was kind of the, it looked like the old school, you know, a guy comes up and spending all his money. And, and I saw this thing one day, he finished training, and he goes to get out in his car, and we're eight weeks away from a fight, and he opens the front of the car, which is the, the, the trunk, it's this little trunk, and inside the trunk is fight posters and a staple gun. Egan's pulling aside, but there was no one that promoted your fight better than you. Selling tickets, T tell us a little bit about 
I mean, it was, it was a dream to work with. You understood it, 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 it your money was affected by it yeah. too as well. Totally. I, I mean, I feel like, you know, as a professional, your success is only as much as what you do or what you put into it, right? So oh, I'm not a promoter, but I'm going to make sure I help the promoter because, you know, we may, we have an agreement how much money I'm going to get paid. and, and 50%, by the way. Yeah, and it's, 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 it's like, why? <laughs> I, I'm a partner in this. Yeah. You know, and I feel like a lot of fighters don't look at it that way. The very few. You know? even, when, even when I made that same deal with them. Yep. Yeah. They feel like they're the star. I'm the promoter. They're the star, and there's some there's something to be said for that. Yeah. But you no know, no one worked harder outside the ring to promote. You also had this um, this white collar following that didn't exist. So we had uh, in in Hawaii we had a big rivalry between Rumble on the Rock and Super Brawl at the time. The the Penn the Penn family, <clears throat> and we both did really big gates, but the <clears throat> the crowd was m markedly different. Um, and it's, I don't mean this in a bad way. You'd go to Rumble on the Rock, and it was gangsters everywhere, and 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 fight shirts and all this. <clears throat> the first three rows of an of an Egan Inouye fight was guys in suits and doctors and and their wives dressed up. You brought an entirely new group of fans to mixed martial arts, and we st I don't know we we weren't even calling it mixed martial arts yet. I don't think it was either no whole, no whole, NHB. Yeah, yeah. But it was an amazing thing. Now. Was that something you thought of doing or just because of your, your image that it worked that way? I felt like you cultivated it. Yeah, I think, I think part of it is, is because of my background was racquetball. Yes. To be a part of a racquetball club, you're, you're amongst different kinds of people and it's not like the nightclub scene and it's, not, it's a whole different um, group of people. The night, nightclub scene would be Rumble on there. That's what it looked like, a, a, a yeah. nightclub, yeah. yeah. So I think yeah. it's a whole different thing. And, you know, nightclubs was not my scene, but... You know, as far as, as businessmen and you know, professionals, I was amongst them a lot. And I feel like that's what my crowd, a lot of my crowd, because I was a li I feel like I was a little bit more like them instead of like a typical fighter. Like I didn't have that. You, you were, you were more, yeah. you were more like them than you were like a fighter. Exactly. You didn't like fighting. I didn't like fighting. You never liked fighting. No. You liked training. Yeah. But you never enjoyed them. That's again the juxtaposition of you two together. I remember you saying that all throughout. It was a financial thing for you. Um, competitive had to be part of it, the yeah. competition part. But I don't even know that that was even. You were making money. Yeah, I was making good money. Yeah. I mean, but that's that's the reason you were. Yep. Period. Yep. There's some comp great. I get to compete too, but it wasn't. And the thing about it is that that's how I convinced myself that this is what I like to do. But now looking back at it. I know what it was. It was actually the process that I fell in love with, the process of training and, and becoming this mixed martial artist. The fight itself, always before I walked into the ring, I was like, I'm never doing this again. Never again. Every and time? Every single time. And as I'm walking to the ring, I'm going, I'm feeling weak. My legs are fluttering. I mean, I'm like, I I'm never going to do this again. But then the process. Then, 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 then I'd bring you the paycheck after. Then and you said, maybe. <laughs> Three minute fight, I, you know. And but then, the process, but the process of the process of growing. I was just in love with the process of of just getting better and just getting better and just getting better. And I feel like, you know, training for mixed martial arts because there's so many different places that you can get better. I could see growth every week. I could see growth. You know, you do something a thousand times, you're better already. You also brought in, and he he may be the first or one of the very first boxing trainers to not just teach boxing, but had an eye to change it for MMA, Rob Frazier, P. Lightning. Yeah. Um, it's a really interesting character that no one's ever gonna hear about unless we say his name yeah. here, because he was so far in the background. But you brought him in and specifically said, Good. "We, I want you to teach me boxing, but you need to think of it in a different way. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah, and, and the thing about it is he's a, you know, boxing is an art. People don't realize what an art it is. It's, it's such a beautiful art, and it's, it's when you're good at boxing, it's really good, but you're going to spend years and years and years and years. I mean, these guys start from when they're young. We, we, we had to get good in yeah. six months. If you, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I was yeah. already, what, 20, right. 29 yeah. before I started fighting? Yeah. And so I remember looking at Rob and telling Rob, he goes, you know what? 
I'm never going to be a good boxer like the guys at Kalakaua Gym that I'd spar with. Yeah. What can I do? Like, I got to be able to do something different. And I noticed that when we got close and we got another tie up, there are things that they couldn't throw the punches as good as they did. And then so Rob came up with this thing. He said, I know what, Egan, we're going to work on you in a dirty box. It's called dirty boxing. Boxers hate it. And then we started training and we're doing these things. Dirty boxing, by the way, is now a term used. I didn't, I didn't even think of it as a, ter- a boxing term used as something dirty, yep. as it's a thing we do in mixed martial arts. Yep. It's a skill. Yeah, it's a skill. That yeah. It really is. Yeah. Then, I re- then when I would box against the guys at Kalakawa, all of a sudden I'm not getting hit anymore. And they were like super frustrated. And I remember Dennis Alexia going, ah, Egan, he's not a fighter. He, and I could nullify his striking, and he was the world Did champion. you strike with Dennis Alexio? I did, I did. I, I didn't know that. He used to come in and, you know, beat the crap out of, and that's where Have you ever been spinning back kick by him? I didn't. I, I, you know what, the thing, my, well, I think I would say lucky is that I came from racquetball. So racquetball, you're ball, quick. In 150 miles an hour, and then anticipation is huge. So body movement, Interesting, yeah. Little things like that. I could see when he was going to spin. So I was combining. <laughs> I was, he used to always call me a runner. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> I've picked that fight of me. I don't yeah. want to get hit. Yeah, come right here, we'll exchange. Come right here, we'll exchange. Yeah. 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 Like the Joseph brothers. I remember all these tough guys from wine. I would come and spar with them. I watched them get broken noses. Yeah. And then I was like, oh my gosh, I don't want to, I don't want to spar with this guy. I used to just like watching him because he was just amazing. Yeah, one of the greatest to ever do it. Yeah. And then I remember Rodney Joseph got his nose broke one day, and he had one more route to go and I was sitting there and he's like, you, hey, come over here. I said, walk over. And I was like, oh, God, this is Rodney and Joseph. Oh my gosh. But, and he goes, you're taking my last round. I looked at him. I was like, holy crap, Frank. All right, Frank, I don't know what to do. You know, it's almost like when you're trying to earn your right in a lineup like at Bulls, the guys tell you to go on this closeout set. And if you don't go, you gotta you're do it. going to get a chance again. You get told your you guy exactly. dropped out of the fight. Exactly. Get in. I, I, I'm not coming back to you. If I said no that day, I'm not coming back to your gym. Yep. And that's not disrespect. That's not, and it's like just, it's just the reality of it. And that was, the, yeah. that was it. And, you know, I survived yeah. that round. I, I fought. I did what I had to. And from then on, I was friends with a lot of these guys from Wyanai just because of that one thing, you know, and oh, yeah, that was, that was, what, <laughs> and it's not the sparring. I didn't like sparring. I yeah. was in love with the process of getting better. Talk a little bit about um, what, as, as local boys, yeah. um, the, and it was different in a lot of the the gyms, other gyms that I walk into, and I've been in, you know, every mixed martial arts gym in Hawaii during the time, taking in and be, be forming friendships, business relationships, and training haoles. Um, There were a lot of, not a lot, but there were percent, actually quite a few of the fighters weren't local born. Did you ever have issues, that kind of local boy issue, like we're going to take care of ourselves? Seemed like you were you didn't give a crap if a guy was a good guy and yeah I mean I I didn't care if, if someone wanted to fight and they would they, they could make it through my training and they'd come day after day after day they're more than welcome it didn't matter what you know where you came from it's kind of a kind of a, a, a evener there yeah the, yeah and I think yeah. that you know I was always looking for the heart like how how tough is your head and how much heart you have and that's heart so it's you know that you guys being totally opposite the heart part is what you both have in in spades and and how you can and and i kind of feel the same way friends i surround myself with in the stunt community watching my kids someone has heart and that's not a good heart they care about people i mean there's something about someone that doesn't have heart that i can lose respect for to take a beating you know what i mean again it's, it's part of it comes from that i'm tougher than i am talented you know what i mean but i take tremendous pride in putting up with beatings from Ensign when we were training, putting up with, with, do you remember the time? This was, I, I had, I was training with you for three weeks, I think, for your first fight. And I, and I got, I got the media c- to come in and there was nobody there to spar with you. And the media was showing. Yeah. And you said, TJ, put it, put on the headgear. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I get in and I, I, I know it afterwards because I now use it all the time. And I'm, j- I'm, barely learning any stand-up and so you need someone to spar with I put on this white headgear and we're going to try we're going to try and get just easy footage and he throws a he throws a leg kick at me I take it and he looks down at my leg again and I look down at my leg and I'm on the floor because he threw the head kick (laughs) 
So that, again, that's I spend most of my stories about me being on the ground as opposed to knocking somebody out. But heart and sin, heart and um, in in human. How it, I guess let's talk a little bit about the culture today, and and again, I've got these four beautiful woke daughters that I love and respect, and um, they're not soft. They're woke. They're, they, I think you can be both. Do you know what I mean? I, what do, what are your thoughts of today's today's culture? I think the the generation now is weak. And I think it's not only because of uh, the restrictions parents had on raising them, but also the way the whole society is. And it's not, I mean, they're not weak because they're not as good children as before. It's because of society guided them. It's like, like fighting. Um, I, I'm going to stop. For, I want to point out, we're, we're talking about all these incredibly violent, tough things. I saw you cry last night in front of people. I saw you cry today. We're not talking about I did cry. not crying, about not having feelings. We're, we're, we're talking about weakness in a different way. Do you know what I mean? I th- and I don't, I don't even know how to even maybe put it out there. As I'm thinking now, what's important is toughness. And I'm not saying it's important not to cry, obviously. What, what's wrong with... It sounds so bad. It sounds like an old man. What's wrong with these kids nowadays? But what, it, what, is, what can be done differently? Crying and every type of emotion is a natural part of the human movement. It's just what you do with it and how often you do it. You know, I mean, you, you, know, you have the crybaby room. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't mean that the tough guy never cries. It just, just takes a lot more to make him cry. Or it's for something more important. Yeah. Again, I, I cry. Part of it's from a head injury recently. I cry a lot more. In the last like five or six years since my last head injury, it's part of that. Maybe that too. I don't know. But I cry a lot more now. <laughs> but I'm but I'm but I'm no I'm no less tough. I'm weaker. You know what I mean? But I'm as tough as I ever was. I like I can't fight as good. I can't. But it's, tough toughness doesn't go away. I just think it's so important to teach our 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 kids and our surrounding people. Um, but it's got to. I think it's got to be done in a way because you're scary. But when you get to know you, you're tough. But you know what I mean. You're you're not on a. You're you're real. You're beautiful. You're loving. All that kind of stuff. I just think it's important for all of us to sort of stand up for that. And and again, this is coming from a guy with really left leaning politics and sort of thoughts thoughts on things. But it, it's scary for me to be saying how scary that what's going on today is. I think it's a balance of toughness and compassion. And back in our day, it was not enough compassion. It was all about toughness. And back in this day, I think it's too much compassion. All right. I think, that, I think that's interesting that we can say that the way it was wasn't correct. Yeah. But the pendulum has swung, has swung too far. Yeah. I think so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so a perfect example is in baseball, we used to the first and second place would get trophies. All the kids yeah. Oh, trophies. my God. It's, I don't understand that it. there's no, you don't teach the kids that you know, there's winning and losing, there's sacrifices. The lessons my kids have won by losing are so far yeah. more. Uh, you know, I've seen so many young fighters in fights and um, there was just a, a guy from K team that competed for the first time, older guy, but competed in, uh, in Naga or whatever it was. And I've seen this happen with fighters. You're in a young fighter in his first, second, third fight and he's in a three round fight hard fight that he loses and another guy on the team at the exact same level is in a fight that same night and he knocks his guy out in 30 seconds the next week at the gym this guy is better than this guy because he fought he, he lost and we, we you could have won but the experience is so more valuable and I mean I mean that so clearly I've seen it two fighters at the same level one loses a three-round fight one wins a 30 second fight the next week in the gym this guy's better than this guy you've seen that right oh yeah we can't be afraid to lose man we can't I mean, you i don't mind being afraid to die but i mean, but you I mean you've learned lessons with that same you've lived, we can't be afraid to lose and it's so hard to see your kids lose yeah. it sucks yeah. it sucks and and i <laughs> you know <laughs> Try and soften, try and soften the fall a little bit, yeah. but even that, you probably, probably, I lean toward too soft. Yeah. As far you know, I, 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 I see it. I'm glad I didn't lean toward. I'd rather lean toward too soft than too hard. But for my girls, 
Your, how old are your daughters? 26, 25. 20. 20. So. 15, those, but those older ones. Yeah, yes. Went through that where but, they would lose and I was all over. The, I'm like, you know why you lost? Because of, yeah. of this, because of this, because of this, because of this. And, you know, not telling them what they did good. Right, you know, right. But I'm super careful with my younger ones where I'm not going to only tell them what they did. Good. But you got you to gotta find the balance. the balance. You know, so for me, a lot of times is I just ask them to tell me. And it's easier because I sway, I don't sway to either side. And lucky for me, you know. They tend to, they tend to know. Yeah, they're like, they're more on the side of like, I sucked and this and that. They go, yeah, but what did you do good? Yeah. And then they would say what they did good. And I, I'm hoping that's, that's the way it's going to work. And, and I feel like, you know, as a father, they talk to me more than my older ones do because I feel like they're not afraid to hear anything that I might say. It's amazing. Amazing. I've, I've got um, I, all four of my girls. I lean too much toward the soft side. Um, but when I say I'm happy I did that in there. And again, it, father to daughters are so unbelievably important. All of my girls don't put up with shit from their boyfriends. You know what I mean? Like, they're, just, they're just used to someone kind of being nice to them that, that that's worked. Um, I want to talk quickly. Not, not quick. I don't care how quickly. Um, the, the bracelets. Um, what, what is the name of your business? Destiny Forever. Destiny Forever. Just um, amazing. Ab. I got to kind of congratulate you last night to watch something grow. How many years have you been a business? I think 14 years. 14 years to find something that that means something. Just, I feel like it has so much meaning, not only to you, but to your customers. Can you talk about, and we'll get to a promo to tell where to find them. Number one, they're 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 unbelievable. Um, how did you come about it, and then how did it become a business? It was uh, in Japan. They believe this is protection. So if you if the bracelet breaks, it's a good thing because it's taking something in place of what's supposed to be to you. And I just so happened to get in. I totaled two Mercedes Benz, and the biggest injury I had was a fat lip from the airbags, and my bracelet broke. And that's when I was like pretty much sold on it. I, it was real or not? Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, always tip a bracelet on. And that's all they did. And I had a guy make them for me. And I decided for my 39th birthday, I, I don't receive presents. I give presents. So I would purchase bracelets from that guy. And there's one year that I, the guy was running from the police. So he couldn't sit down and make bracelets. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> so, I took you, you know, so he told me, I'll teach you. And I was like, I first declined. I said, no, it's too intricate. There's no way I'm going to sit down and make that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. He said, don't worry, I'll teach you. And he taught me. For about a couple of years, I think I made it as a hobby. And then when I got confident, I started making it for friends as gifts. And then when I put it on Facebook, that's when it blew up. But people wanted to buy, and we, so I decided to create a website, and it just blew up on online. And then my mom knew someone that was doing the island fair here in Turkey. Yeah. And she just suggested I try that. And I was saying, well, oh, I don't want to sit at the booth and, you know, make sales. And I thought the island Small fair. Small talk. And... Like five or six bracelets, that'd be awesome. But yeah. I think I got... I got lucky because the reception I got from being away from home for so long. I had so many people from high school, from grade school, come in and support. I mean, the aloha that Hawaii has, yeah. So I had that support, and it just, I mean, I couldn't keep up. Do you do more Do you do more business in Japan or in Hawaii? Here. Here? Yeah. yeah. And I come here about four times a year, open up shop, and I'm constantly, literally making bracelets from, say, 8 in the morning to, or 10 in the morning to, sometimes it's been like, Probably good, probably good for your fingers. Yeah, really. I have no problems. Yeah, I mean, it probably helps you. It helps kind of rehab. Yeah. Where, where can people find you? Online is destinyforever.com. Uh, if not, yeah, and you're you're going back home tomorrow, so you're not gonna be back in Hawaii till. Yeah. So when, whenever I'm gone, I just close the shop and I just pay rent every time I'm gone. And I come back in March, probably not have the date set, but whenever I have it. Set, Where's your shop? Kakaku, in Kakaku. So yeah. When I set the dates, I let everyone know, and I get, I get, everyone's waiting, so it's so awesome. See that? It's a real, it's just, it's a, me being a lifelong entrepreneur, you as well, and we're all just entrepreneurs in one way or another. It's just exciting to see someone succeed or someone kind of by mistake. Most of my best things I've done have been by mistake, but just God, whatever, right place, right time, I don't give a shit what it is but it seems like to, when I try and do something really hard I don't do as well when I kind of get out of my own way things 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 sort of happen it's lucky because it's something I love like Egan loves fitness yeah I yeah love, I love making bracelets yeah I just enjoy yeah it.
Well, I, I love I love the, the segue to Egan's fitness because I've, you know, learned more from him mixed martial arts than I don't know if more important lessons than anyone else. But I've now in the I'm 57. You're 56. 58. Oh, you're older than me, old man. All right, and you're 55, 56. So we're all in that same age. And the and the and I've always talked about loving aging and not worrying about it. And I really felt pretty indestructible into my 50s. It was maybe 52, 53 where I started, shit started happening. Like, oh fuck, I'm, I'm getting old. Like it's the injuries, whatever it is. And, and the, the, the finite amount of life I have left has gotten real. Like it's, I take it so freaking serious. How many summers do I have left? You know what I mean? How many times am I going to see my kids again? <laughs> yes, it's true. Really? <laughs> so, Egan's, I've been following Egan, and for me, so this incredibly emotional thing, how many more times am I going to see my kids? I want it to be as many as freaking possible. Um, and I know I need physical health to do that. Um, I've been working on mental health, spiritual health, physical, but I stopped... I had to change the way I, in the last five years, how I work on my physical health and how unbelievably important it is for me. And I can only talk for myself to find new ways of train. Um, you have these great young fighters, athletes, you do your boot camps, but I'm seeing you start to work with people much older than us. But I, I want to talk a little bit about aging and fitness and particularly anyone if you're under 40, shut off. It's kind of the end of the podcast. But if you're over 40, how important is this for us to stay fit? And, and what is the difference? Physically fit is different for me now than it was 10 years ago. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, that's always been my thing, right? Like, as far as a racquetball player, as far as a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and MMA, there's techniques and there. That's important. That's super important. But I've always known that my ability of maybe not as good a racket uh, at racquetball as others being in better shape being stronger is an advantage when i got to jiu-jitsu same thing yeah i mean uh, like i won the world championships in, in, in the blue belt i wasn't as good as all the other guys let me i'm gonna stop right now this is for for my niece maggie who we know you heard he said he won the world champions as a blue you didn't say you won the world championship you added in that you were a blue belt yeah. drives me crazy when people say i'm a world champion and they won a blue belt you're not a fucking world champion. You are the best blue belt in the world. Okay, thank you. <laughs> it's, yes, absolutely. Great. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> it's weird because that one is blue belt. If you guys are ever a blue belt and you compete it, yeah. it's probably far the hardest belt to win. And the reason why is by the time you get to black belt, you got all the scouting. You got videos on the guy. You, yeah. you can pretty much make a game plan. Not saying that it'll work, but at least you yeah. got game plans. Whereas right. in the blue belt, you go to Brazil and fight in the blue belt is different than fighting blue belt here in America because there's guys that don't have the money yeah. to travel to America. And You're like, getting hey, killers. Go ahead and try to go to a gym there and roll with a blue belt as a black belt. You're going to realize that there's blue belts there that's been training for 15 years. I've got one. I'm gonna, before we get into the fitness thing, I just thought, thought of something. I'll, I'll quickly tell the... A new, a new a versus Gracie sort of war, and it was a, it was a scary thing at the time for me at least. I want to kind of get your, your guys' thoughts on it. You both started training with with Helsing Gracie really, really early '90s, pre UFC kind of, or right during UFC. And people will understand when I say this that as a blue belt, you decided to leave Helsing and open your own gym, which sounds absolutely ridiculous at the time. Um, number one, you were a blue belt like no other blue belt in the world, clearly. Um, and there were maybe three American black belts in the world. Like, there, there weren't, but you didn't, you could go years without meeting a black belt. Um, but this caused, and I, taught, I told my Helsing Gracie story and how sort of protective he is over whatever it is. He, he took it really, really serious. Um, and you guys ended up having a huge brawl at the Pan Ams that were held here um, that basically turned into Brazil, where there were a lot of Brazilians versus Hawaii horrible. There were then death threats. There were police got involved. Um, you haven't been to Brazil since. Is that correct? Yeah, and I don't, I would think it would be different now. 
Did you not go to Brazil because your life would have been in danger? No, I probably would have went back. And the, and the reason I'd say that is, yeah, they, a lot of the guys heard the stories from Helson. Yeah. And there's, there, of course, they're going to be that side that'll believe everything Helson says. But there's the Henzo Gracies out there. There's the other guys that I... Carlson. Carlson Gracie. Yeah. Shadows. Yeah. And I don't want to say it's in a bad way, but those guys were the, I want to say the smarter of the group. And the only reason I say that is because they had an open mind. Uh, Ricardo Laborio. Yeah. I mean, these guys are like, these are the names of the past and they're, they're going to be, they're legends. And I feel like those guys had my back. I mean, Enzo freaking helped me so much. He, really? He has no idea. I, mean, I remember, I, was, I remember when you, when you had your match against him in ADCC yeah. and beat him. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I, and I beat him and it was a horrible, but great thing for me. But the thing, and, and I want to point that out again, it was the fitness level because I was, I'm not a better jujitsu guy. He knows, wait, he knew more. A year, what is it? Two years before that, I was a blue belt training with him. He did anything he wanted to do to me. Yeah. And he was so cool about it. And then I'm going to fight him two years later at the World Championships in Abu Dhabi. And I thought, like, you know, and going back to what I was saying, that we can study the person. Yeah. I created a, a game plan on how I was going to beat Henzo. And I knew how I was going to beat Henzo. I knew how I was going to beat Laborio. And I beat all these great guys, not because I was a, I knew more jiu-jitsu as a better grappler. They're, I'm going to say right till today, they're probably still better than me. And I'll never be as good as those guys. But the game strategy, that process of preparing for that event was my thing. And I loved doing it. And that's the only reason why I won. And, you know, and those guys love me. I mean, we're still good. That's people. awesome. It's awesome to hear. And they've heard all the stories from Helsing. Yeah. And, and Henzo's come up to me and go, he's crazy and whatever. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and I feel... I mean, I would go back to Brazil. We we could we could do two more hours on oh, yeah. on that on that. I decided not to get into it because I have my own story. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I don't think it's getting. I want to talk about you, about your business and what you're doing. So let's go. And so going back to fitness. So yeah. Then I realized like what fitness was, and when I was a pharmaceutical rep, one of my drugs was was uh, Zocor, which is a, a cholesterol drug. And at that time, I was visiting cardiologists, and I was so into training, and I had this belief that. If I trained at 100, and I, was get, I used to get my heart up to 120 beats per minute. And you know, there's that calculation, your age minus. The zone. Yeah, yeah, your zone. I've, I've, got, it, I've got it on my yeah. Fitbit. Yeah. And then they, they give you these guidelines. And I used to, like, every year that guideline goes lower and lower. Your max heart rate gets right. lower and lower. Right. I can work easier yeah. now. And I kept thinking to myself, man, that's just killing us. Like, that, that's, a, that's a governor that this put on our head that we cannot believe. And so I went in and I asked them one day. I said, you know what? Is that bad for me? At that time, my max heart rate was supposed to be 193. Yeah. And I was training at 220. <laughs> you had your heart rate at 220? Yeah, and my belief was like, I was comfortable. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I noticed that when I started and got it for racquetball, if I could get someone tired, they'd start making all the mistakes. Right. But it was really hard because there's timeouts and I, I yeah. can't put my hands on them. Yeah. <laughs> when it came to jujitsu or grappling, I can, I can push the envelope and I can push it and push it. And what I noticed is that if you only train at 180 beats per minute and that made you uncomfortable and you got need a rest and you got a break, that's where I'm going to break you. And my whole philosophy in fighting, and, and Barrett still goes by this today, is that whether I win or lose when I fight with you, if I put you to the greatest war or the most pain that you've ever been through, and not like from beating yeah, you up, yeah. you're never going to beat me again because you don't want to fight me again. And that's the attitude I always had. And that's why fitness was so important to me. Right, and going back to the cardiologist, I asked him, I said, so what is this max heart rate thing? And most of them told me, better not. So when I hit max heart rate, does that mean my heart blows up? Right. Yeah, for some people they would. And I said, well, I trained at 220. And they're like, what? Like, and it was the first time they heard of it. And then they got interested and, and you know, like a lot of people like, it's hard as a pharmaceutical rep to get in to see the doctors. But because I established that side, okay, so what is your heart rate at now? And how are you feeling now? And what is going on? And that's where I started studying the heart even more. And I started realizing like, you know, that with the brain and then, you know, pain tolerance, pain thresholds. I run the clinics on that where I take young athletes and I teach them that where they thought they needed to stop, they could actually go way more. And then now there's studies saying that when you hit that point where your brain says, I can't go anymore, you actually have 60% left in your gas tank. And people just never utilize that. 
And so, and, and it's not dangerous to go beyond that. Yeah, I mean, if you're a couch potato. And right, of course, of course, yeah, yeah. 20, I'm not yeah. going to take you to 130. Right, right. Right, so this yeah. guy I'm training now is 97, and he'll be 98. Um, I got him to 100 beats per minute, and he was dying. And yeah, and yeah. Like, oh, yeah. And I was like, whoa. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I'm like, no, rest, rest. No. Yeah. He didn't know what my goal for him was. His max heart rate is 124 beats per minute. This is max heart rate according to those charts. Right. Those charts are made for liability, and that's yeah. what the cardiologist told me that that's what it's for. It's a liability thing. Anyway, so I've been working with this guy, not only on coordination, because I believe coordination has a lot to do with your brain. And I feel like as we get older, guys are doing Sudoku, they're reading more, and I don't like Sudoku. Right. I don't like right. reading. So <clears throat> how am I going to keep my brain good? And so I started doing this coordination stuff and I started, there, and I've always been trying to work both sides. I always believe jujitsu, most guys pass one yeah, side. Yeah, yeah. I, I, go I go right, I go right. I go both sides. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know which way, yeah. which way do you go? I yeah, know, yeah. Because that's how I've always trained. And so that's one of the things and you know, that as I was getting older, I started realizing, you know, I think because I've always been in a deficit. When I started racquetball, I started at 16. All the guys I competed with started at eight. So I've always been this deficit where these guys are way better racquetball players than I am. But I had to figure out how I'm gonna. And I feel like that's been my thing. And so training is the same thing. My training has to change. I mean, I was, I fought my last fight at 42 years old. I mean, yeah. I'm old and I fought yeah. a 20 year old. Yeah. I'm gonna be the 20 year old. Yeah. Cardiovascular, there's no way. Right. I can train at 220 anymore. Yeah. Right, and so I figured out all these different things and I'm hoping that even the brain thing, you know, to help you. <coughs> So how are you passing that along to your clients, students? So what's, what's been good is anyone who trained with me in the past knows how brutal my training is. And now if you train with me, you're going to realize like it's not <coughs> as brutal as you think because I've learned to train a lot smarter and I use all of these different things, coordination, I use heart rate, I use all of these different things and it's super important because I can get someone from, you know, like this guy, 97, I can, he can do it with <coughs> I was, I was watching it on, yeah, from bouncing a ball off a wall with one hand. I don't know that I could, I'm not going to try right now. I'll try it after you guys leave for sure. But yeah, really, really cool. And I think, I think what I've watched from him, and I love following your social media, is that we can learn. I feel like I'm, what can I learn at 57? Well, this guy's 97 and he's, and he's learning and getting better, not just learning, but getting better at things. And, and I, I've talked to them to been, had a back injury that's really bothered me. And I've now been spending a lot of time working on balance and things I never would have thought I needed. But now I know as I get older and older, balance is an incredibly important thing. Yeah, it's how my mom, my mom passed away from Alzheimer's, but she fell, broke her hip, and that's how they go. Yeah, that was another thing, right? When I was at pharmaceuticals, I did Fosamax, which is a bone density. And so I studied bone density there. And that's where I started understanding more. Strength, so strength training yeah, is important as you get older. And balance, right? So one of the things they tell you is if you fall and you fracture your hip at an old age, you have five years. Yeah. Yes. You, you right. Five years to live. I mean, yeah. That's unbelievable. Stuff. She had six weeks. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's, that's just how it is. And so I started, and my grandparents, my grandfather was using his balance. So then I started studying from back then. And, you know, like... I work with this 93 year old guy that I was originally hired because he kept falling. It's been oh, I didn't know that. Day. Yeah. He hasn't fallen in three years. Yeah. And so I know what I'm doing is exactly what it is, which we do in boot camp. And like we have a. Um, love, your boot, love your boot camps. Love watching those. I, it's funny. Your boot camps are filled with a wide range, but lots of middle aged women of various shapes and sizes. And it's what I was doing with you with a fight team. Exactly. A little different, exactly. but it's so fun to watch the camaraderie, the, the, the hearing you yelling at them, <laughs> and, no, encouraging them. Yeah, yeah, Are you yeah. encouraging them? <laughs> yes, it's crazy. encouraging. Yeah, yeah. So tell us, what do we find your, your gym? Your... So we're, our, our main gym is, is 12 Tall Punahou. It's spectacular. I, I saw it last yeah. night. What a gym. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's, we got weights on the top. We got our boot camp and, you know, we work in, you know, our clientele's, I'm aging. So it's a perfect time yes. to work with guys that are also aging. And, and I feel like we fall right into that, that, that zone. Right? And that's why I brought in weights. I'm not a real big believer in weightlifting. Right. right? In, as far as machines wise. Yes. But 
free weight stuff. I'm really, I'm a big believer in that. And I don't lift that much weight for myself because just, just not how it is. I'm more about functional strength. So I like body weight stuff. And, and what I've noticed through the years is as fighters, as athletes, guys start lifting too much weight and then they start losing mobility. They also start pulling muscles, tearing muscles. Yeah. And, yeah. and like knock on wood, I mean, I mean, I've had knee surgeries at you. Yeah. Know, yeah. You know, neck surgery. Right. But as far as pulling muscles yeah. and getting hurt and injured and yeah. pulling my back, almost never happened. Yeah. And I All feel right. like it goes back to your training. Well, guys, I'm, it's, it's, thank you. I know you both are incredibly busy. You're going back to Japan tomorrow. You've got so much to do. You're, uh, you missed surfing for me this morning. Um, <laughs> The, 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 yeah, That's a but but too. but I know I know. This, the, but I just want to say this was everything I hoped it would be and more. This is this is what I don't know what I'm what I'm whether this becomes a business. Or, I think it's important for us to archive history to kind of share stories. Um, thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you. Awesome.